Um, so I was just informed that the overflow room is also at capacity. This room is also at capacity. Um, we are currently attempting to open another classroom uh, for the people still outside, um, just uh, as an information, but we are going to get started. Um, thank you so much for everyone who is in this room, in the overflow room outside, um, the people watching at home on our Southwestern website streaming. Uh, we are so excited to have everyone here, um, and we are especially excited to um, welcome Dolores Huerta to our Southwestern community. Uh, first, I would definitely like to thank all of our sponsors for this event who helped to bring um, the letters uh, here. The first of which is the Coalition of Diversity and Social Justice. My name is Marissa Madrid Ortega and I am the president of this organization. Um, we would also like to thank Kappa Delta Chi, the Office of Diversity Education, the Diversity Enrichment Committee, the Jesse Daniel Ames Endowed Lecture in Feminist Studies, as well as Latin American and Border Studies. Um, in addition to all of our sponsors, we would also like to thank marketing, IT, and physical plant for helping us all pull this together. And so with that, I would like to first introduce Luz Zamora, um, a member of Kappa Delta Chi. She will be singing a farm workers movement song for us before introducing Ms. Dolores Huerta. So thank you very much for coming. After, um, after Dolores Huerta speaks, there will be a Q&A session, so keep your questions in mind and we will be taking questions afterwards. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your introduction, Marissa. I will be singing No Nos Moveran, We Shall Not Be Moved, and feel free to join in. No, 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 no nos moveran. No, 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 no nos moveran. Como un árbol firme junto a río. No. special honor to introduce Ms. Dolores Huerta, our distinguished guest this evening. She will be presenting the Office of Diversity Education Lecture and the Jesse Daniel Ames Endowed Lecture in Feminist Studies. Ms. Huerta has a long distinguished career as a labor organizer and social justice leader. She emerged from the Mexican-American community beginning in the late 1960s 
and continues to speak out against the injustice that she first witnessed and experienced as a Mexican-American. Her sense of social justice expanded to include farm workers, women, and other Latinos, and even the larger aggrieved humanity around the world. Dolores Fernandez, better known as Dolores Huerta, was born April 10, 1930, in Dawson, Arizona, New Mexico, excuse me, the second child of Juan and Alicia Chavez Fernandez. At the age of three, her mother moved the family to Stockton, California, where Miss Huerta excelled academically and became a teacher. Ms. Huerta co-founded the Stockton branch of the Community Service Organization, a grassroots organization dedicated to fighting discrimination, social inequality, and pr police brutality, brutality, and to improving the social conditions of farm working families. She established the Agricultural Workers Association in 1960, but is probably best known for joining with Cesar Chavez and founding the National Farm Workers Association and later the United Farm Workers Union, an affiliate of the AFL CIO. She established the Agricultural Workers Association in 1960, but is probably, I already said that, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Huerta helps lead a number of workers' actions, including the historic grape and lettuce strikes and boycotts that won important be uh, bargaining rights and major improvements in the working conditions in the farms of California, as well as in Texas and other places in the Midwest. Ms. Huerta has been honored for her work on behalf of farm workers, immigrants, and women. In 2003, Ms. Huerta founded the Dolores Huerta Foundation, and she continues organizing communities and empowering them to solve their problems, such as stopping the school-to-prison pipeline. I will cite some of the work that she has been honored for. She has received the Ellis Island Medal of Freedom Award and was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In 1998, she received the Eleanor Roosevelt Award, and in 2002, she received the Puffin Nation Prize for Creative Citizenship. In 2012, President Barack Obama presented her with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor that our nation bestows on a civilian. Ms. Huerta, you honor us with your presence. Please give our guest, Dolores Huerta, a wholehearted Southwestern welcome. Oh my goodness, you know, how did this happen? 
And I think we have to analyze and see how, how, do, how do we get to this point in the United States of America. And, and I do believe that we do have solutions. And I think some of the solutions are already in place. And one of them, I think, because we're here in an educational institution, uh, I believe that we start with education. Because we have the structures for education. You know, we have our schools, uh, our elementary schools, our middle schools, our high schools, and of course our colleges. But I think that the one thing that we have to do is look at the content of what is taught in our schools. What is the content? And somehow, it seems like a lot of things have been left out of our educational system. And because a lot of things have been left out, and this is why we are here where we're at today, uh, we get to, well, how could we as a nation uh, have so much, but I won't say the word ignorance, that people don't know? How could we have so much ignorance in our society that if the leadership can get away with it, the type of activities and the statements that they are saying and doing against poor people, against people of color, against women, against the LGBT community, against working people, you know, and desecrating our, our planet. Uh, so, and I do believe that the reason, and I don't think many of you in this room will agree with me, especially people of color, uh, because we're saying, hey, this is nothing new. We've been living this. We've been living this every single day of our lives with microaggressions and discrimination, the, the lack of resources uh, in our communities of color. But I think that we kind of have to hold it back a little bit and say, well, you know, why, why is it that uh, the contributions of people of color have never been taught in our school system? And I mean, I'm talking about pre-K, pre-kindergarten, uh, because racism starts, you know, when children are very small, and children, as we know, are not born racist. Uh, you know, they get this from their parents and the society around them. And so, uh, I don't think any of us in our school books and elementary school ever learned. And I think we knew about Native Americans. <coughs> I think we reflected on the fact that this land that we sit on belongs to Native Americans, but somehow we have never compensated them. And in our reservations, we find some of the poorest people, the highest suicide rate, you know, the highest health issues that we have in the uh, reservation. And we never paid back our Native American population for the land that we took from them. And then, it has never been taught in our school books that the White House and the Congress of the United States of America. And many of the buildings in Washington, D.C. were built by who? Mm -hmm. African slaves, right? African slaves, right? I was just uh, last week at the inauguration of the new governor of Virginia in the mansion, you know, that African slaves built. And in the capital, the African slaves built. And somehow that was not part of the governor's speech. <laughs> it's hardly ever mentioned when we talk about the people that, that founded this country. And then about the immigrants who came, the people from Mexico. Mexicans are good, everybody. children, they are poisoned then uh, with the whole notion of white supremacy. And this is how we know about to create it, because it's out of ignorance. And then we can go on further, we can think about the attacks on other people, people like the people in the labor movement. People, again, you know, when workers are the ones that actually do all the daily work in our country, and, and like in places like Texas, when you have what they call like the work laws. Yeah, we just want to turn up your mic a little bit. Sorry, everyone. Is this better? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, in, in places like Texas and many places in the South and the Midwest, 
um, where they have what they call these rent to work laws. And rent to work really means you can work for lower wages and no benefits, like a pension plan that workers should have when they retire working and they can't work anymore so that they can have something to live on. Something besides social security, which is not really a number of people to survive on. And this is what people get when they join a labor. You don't have a back home. <laughs> organization of workers. That's all that it is. And when we think of the employers, you know, they have many organizations that they actually pay dues to and fees to. <laughs> so going back to labor. <laughs> Association, um, you know, whatever uh, particular trades that they have. Um, and we think, like, farm workers, for instance, the growers belong to the Western Growers, the Farm Bureau Federation, the Wine and Tree Fruit League, Associated Farmers, etc., 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 Western Growers, etc. And so they belong to all these five or six different organizations. And you think about farm workers, where's their organization? They only have one organization, and that is a labor union. And uh, yes, that, that organization is going to depend them on, on the workplace uh, to make sure that they're treated properly, uh, that uh, they have seniority rights on the job, that they've been there a long time, that there's a promotion, that person should be able to get it, make sure that they're not fired unjustly. You know, and, and not only prote protecting them on the job, but protecting them uh, in the state capital, Sacramento, or in this case it would be Austin, or uh, protecting them up in Washington, D.C., and in the, in, in the Congress to make sure that workers have their rights. And sometimes the employers, what they call workers special interests, well, workers is the majority of the people in the United States of America. So how can they be a special interest, right? <laughs> and yet, in many states like Texas, uh, they pass laws that make it very difficult uh, for their labor unions to collect fees for their workers. Now the employers, with all their organizations, they pay dues. Even the doctors, you know, when they have the Medi American Medical Association, the attorneys have the Bar Association, they pay dues, they pay fees to their organization. And so workers also have to pay fees so that they can pay the people that are representing them, uh, on the job to actually uh, pay the people that are representing them in the Congress of the United States or in the state capitol. And so but what the employers do is that they, pa they pass these laws like right to work. And it makes it very difficult for the union uh, to get fees from the workers. Because basically the best way for a labor union to collect those fees is what they call a check off. Just like you get your social security checked off on your check. And then the, so the union organizer doesn't have to go to each person and say, would you pay your fees to the, to the union this month? They get an automatic checkoff, which goes directly to the union. Now, if, uh, if a, a union member or representative has to go to every single person, then the, the boss knows who's pro-union and who isn't. And the people that are pro-union, then they can make their life difficult and then try to get rid of them, okay? So this is the way that they are able to keep unions, uh, from, to keep them weak, you know, and when you think of the money, which is the lifeblood of the labor organization to pay their organizers and reps, this is how they keep labor weak. Now, think about this. And again, this is not taught in our school books. How did we get the, an eight-hour day? How did we get a weekend, right? Disability insurance, workers' compensation, social security, safety standards. We got all of these because of labor, organized labor. and. In addition to that, public education. We got all of this through organized labor. And workers actually were killed. You know, they protested. They, people were killed to be able to get these rights. Or workers were killed to get these rights for us. And yet, we, people kind of take all of this for granted because they don't know the history of how labor union was able to achieve uh, those benefits for workers. 
You know, so it, you know, it, it's kind of a blank to us. And uh, the other, the other thing that we really have to think about again when we think about this moment that we're living today, with the attack on labor unions on organized labor, then you know what happens? Labor unions are able to raise the wages because they negotiate with the employers so that workers can get better pay. And even some of those uh, companies uh, that don't have a labor union, they have to match those wages. So when we have higher wages in this country, then we have what we call the middle class, right? And we all know that the middle class in the United States is shrinking. It's getting smaller. And labor unions are weaker because they're under such a tag. The other thing we have to worry about is if we do not have a middle class, guess what? We don't have a democracy. If we do not have a middle class, we do not have a, have a democracy. And if we, if we can see what's happening in today's world, where you have like 10% of the people in the United States own 90% of the wealth. 10%. And then you have the 1% that owns 50% of the wealth. And at the same time, we see that people are struggling. Uh, you know, people have to work two jobs to be able to pay their rent, you know, to be able to pay their mortgages, people to buy their food, and just the basic necessities of life that they need. And at the same time, we have multi-millionaires that their salary for one year is, you know, $16 million or more. There was one CEO that was caught, his salary was like $250 million, one person. I mean, that's an obscenity. Because I don't care, you know, how much money you have, you can only eat three meals a day. Right? <laughs> you can only wear one suit of clothes a day. Right? So, but what is the sense of them having all of this, all of this money, and it's not shared with the rest of the world? And so, I think we have to kind of rethink. We have to kind of rethink about the way that our system works. That here we are, the richest country in the world, and yet we do not have free education for everybody, which we should have. You know, we should have universal health health care for everybody. You know, this should be a right. And it isn't that we can't have it if we're the richest country in the world, because when we look at other countries, like in the Scandinavian countries, you know, or even if we look at little Cuba, which is a very, a very poor country. But what do they have that we don't have? They have free education, college education, for every single person in Cuba. And many of these other countries in, in Europe, the Scandinavian countries, they have free education, universal health care, and yes, they even have early childhood education for parents, right? You know, and, and long time for people to take vacations, and when uh, people need family leave, uh, they can take months of family leave. And yes, they pay higher taxes, but people have all of these benefits. And so we think, well, why can't we get there? Why can't we in the United States get there? Well, it all comes down to this. Oh, one more thing. So we know that we need these benefits. We need. We know we need free college education. And you know, recently, our president said something attacking the African countries, right? About uh, you know, we know what they were being called. You know, kind of obscenities for these African countries and and some of the countries uh, in Latin America also. Well, you know what? In Nigeria. They have a better graduation, college graduation rate than we do. How about that? <laughs> and Cuba has the highest literacy rate of all of the Americas. The highest literacy rate of all of the Americas, you know? Uh, so that kind of shows, of course, the ignorance of our president, right? When he makes stupid statements like that, you know? <laughs> And again, it shows up also his, his racism. Uh, but again, when we think of countries, that, and I want to talk about Norway, because again, the president was also talking about Norway, right? Everybody should come from Norway, right? To the United States of America, okay? Uh, well, when we think about Norway, and I remember uh, reading in the New York Times, uh, I, by the way, I like to read the New York Times, especially the business page. I call it the crime report. <laughs> I read the New York Times uh, that uh, the New York Times uh, had $400 billion in surplus in that country. And you know, at that time, uh, and probably still we were running a deficit in the United States of America. So I thought to myself, where did they get all of that money? Well, you know what? They got it from their oil. Because they own their oil. They own their oil. And so I thought, huh, 
In the United States, we do not own our oil. Private corporations own our oil. Private corporations own our telephone systems, right? And our transportation systems, and our utility systems. You know, in California, I'm from California, and of course we have co corporations there that own our water in California. In California, about 60% of the petroleum that we produce is actually in the state of California. You know, and yet we pay with this really high money for gasoline, and where does our money go? To corporations, and to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you know, so wonder they have so many millions of dollars, right, that they can spend millions of dollars just to buy paintings and things like that. So this is kind of a wrong picture. You know, this picture is wrong and it needs to be changed. And because we, I think the people of the United States have got to start saying, we've got to fight. We've got to fight so that we, the people of the United States, can own our own resources. And so that we can then spend that money and it can be shared with everybody. You know, when we think about the homeless people that we see on the streets, how did we get to this space where people can't even afford to, to pay rent anymore? You know, and I think we've got to go back uh, to kind of uh, the indigenous people way of life. And when I say that is because, uh, and I'm going to quote Ibo Morales. Ibo Morales was the president of Bolivia, is the president of Bolivia. And he made the statement once. He said, you know, the indigenous way, the native people, we want to live well. The European way is to always live better. So you always want more and more and more. And you can never be satisfied because you're always going to want more, you know, instead of just living better. So what if we go back to indigenous ways and we think in uh, terms of cooperation, in terms of sharing, in terms of supporting each other, you know, and then maybe we wouldn't have so many homeless people. So uh, we, you know, and Gandhi said, we should live simply so that others can simply live. Because we have a culture of materialism in our country, you know? And, and, uh, and the thing is that we accumulate so much stuff that we have to have yard sales. <laughs> and then we have to buy, we have to buy, uh, you know, buy uh, places to store our stuff because we have so much stuff, right? And when you think about it, you can't take it with you. You never see, see a hearse with a U-Haul in the back. <laughs> <laughs> And I think the best thing that we can think about is that when we die, and I know you're all in school because you want to live a better life, and that's great. You know, we do have to have people educated in our society, and we do want to live a better life. But, you know, don't think of just, uh, you know, buying, and because it actually our planet did not sustain the American lifestyle. Uh, you know, uh, United States, Japan, and Germany, our three countries uh, use about 75% of the world's resources. And we, and we can't sustain that, that type of lifestyle. And the thing is, in the United States, if, if the other countries don't uh, want to copy our lifestyle, then we, we don't like them anymore, you know? Like the Evo Morales of Bolivia, right? We don't like them. We make them, or the people in Cuba, somehow, you know, we don't like them, we don't like them because they don't adopt the U.S. lifestyle of materialism. So I think these are things that we can think about. And, you know, and when you die, and we think of people like Dr. Martin Luther King, and we think of, of God, we think of Cesar Chavez, you know, uh, by the way, when Caesar died, his annual income was $6,000. That was uh, his annual income. So when, when we die, we want to leave a legacy of justice. Uh, because uh, if you leave property or jewels or a house, your kids are going to fight, okay? <laughs> but if you leave them a legacy of justice, of course, uh, that's going to continue. You know, the, so uh, the other thing that we have to think about again when we talk about other countries is the way that we treat other countries. And again, oh, but, you know, when uh, Trump made the, this, uh, the remarks about African countries and um, countries in Latin America, we have to remind him. Again, this shows that he really doesn't have any sense of history because so many of the, the European countries, where did they get their wealth from? If they, if they were able to pay back all of the gold that they took in Latin America with interest, there would be no poverty in Latin America. And what about all of the diamonds and all of the minerals and the gold that they're taking out of Africa? You know? And then, and, and we think of present day to day, like, um, I'm going to say the word bananas. How many bananas do we eat every day? All over the United States of America. People eat a lot of bananas. 
But do the people in Guatemala get those bana the money for the bananas? Or the people of Honduras or El Salvador? No. Who gets the money that we spend on bananas? It goes to Dole. Or Chiquita Banana. Or the other 50 banana companies. Uh, you know, the U.S. companies are the ones that get the profits. And I call that economic colonization. Economic colonization. Because the United States, instead of helping countries develop their own economic systems, we go in there and we take it over. We go in there and we take it over. And it's very, very deliberate. And I'm glad, in one respect, that they are talking about negotiating NAFTA uh, to make it fairer uh, to the countries uh, that, that are neatest, the, the neatest countries, neediest countries. Uh, you know, and we think about what happened in World War II. We defeated Japan and Germany in World War II. They were our enemies. But then the United States had what they call a Marshall Plan. In the Marshall Plan, we gave jillions of dollars to Japan and to Germany to rebuild their corporations. And so the people that were fighting us during World War II, the same corporations, we gave them the money to rebuild in their countries. And companies like Toyota, etc., Volkswagen, you know? But we did that. And we could do that with the Latin American countries and countries in Africa and countries in the Middle East instead of having these wars. With all of the money that we have spent killing people in the Middle East, if we would have helped those countries, especially the ones that need it, not Saudi Arabia, but the ones that need it develop their own economies and not just, you know, trying to take over. I remember during the marches that we had before uh, the war in the Middle East started, one of the signs that really, I really liked, it was a sign that said, how did our oil get under their sand? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that kind, of, that kind of explains what happened. And so when we think of all of these policies that we want to change, uh, there's only one way that we can do it. And that is that we have to elect people to Congress. You know, we have to elect people to Congress that are going to change uh, these policies that we have in the United States of America. You know, uh, and, and it can happen. But the only way that we can do that is to make sure that every single citizen gets engaged and that people really vote and, and people run for office, people like yourselves. When you think about that, you might say, me, run for office? When you think of some of the people that are there? <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that we have to do in order to be able to do that is we have to, you know, get the money out of politics, and we have to go for public campaign financing. And this is something that we can actually do. Again, how do we do it? By getting people elected to office that will make those policy changes. Now, I want to talk about voting, and you know, Texas, Texas, you all brag that you are the biggest, and, and whatever, whatever. Okay. <laughs> When it comes to voting, you are one of the worst states in the United States of America. Not only because people don't vote, which is bad, but the voter registration laws that you have in Texas, we changed those laws in California in 1961. <laughs> Over 50 years ago. I lobbied a bill to the state legislature in California because we have the same system that you have here where people have to go to a deputy registrar uh, to get deputy, you know, to be able to register to vote. We changed that law. In California, anybody over 18 who was a citizen, or was 18 and over, who was a citizen can register anybody else to vote. Anybody. You can register to vote on your cell phone. You can register to vote on your computer, okay? And right now, actually, in California, anybody who signs up for a driver's license is automatically registered to vote. And not only that, but if you're 16 years old, you can register to vote. You can't vote until you're 18, but you can register to vote. And I think this is one of the things that I hope all of you start really hounding your representatives to say, why are we using a system of voter registration that is 50 years old, half a century? Why are we doing that? And I think you have to shame of the politicians and say, we've got to change this law. I mean, because you are depriving people of voting. Also, absentee ballots. In California, anybody can register and they'll mail your ballot to your house. And you can just mark it and put it in the mail and you already voted. You don't even have to go down to the voting place. And they just passed another law 
for those organizations that are really getting out there, getting people to vote, you can pick up the ballots for them and stick them in the mailbox yourself or take them back to the county clerk's office. So Texas, I mean, we need you. We need you. You know, you've got to join uh, the progressive movement, Texas. Okay. <laughs> talking about, you know, and to be able to protect uh, people. And let's talk a little bit about women, okay? Uh, and isn't it great that we have the Me Too movement? Yeah. <laughs> I think we can all say time's up, right, for everybody, okay? Time is up. Uh, and, and we were talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, but I, I want to say this too. When you celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King, don't forget Coretta. Yeah. Coretta King is why. Right. And the reason I'm saying this is because without Coretta Scott King, there would be no Martin Luther King holiday. It wouldn't exist. Because she, Harry Belafonte, Stevie Wonder, and other uh, African American entertainers and leaders went out there and they fought really, really hard uh, to get this holiday. Now, I was very blessed to be uh, in, the, in the Los Angeles uh, on LK Day and was there in the march and there were thousands and thousands of people uh, uh, on the march route, and that made me feel so good, you know, because we know that that is something that was done again, the change was done by a vote in the Congress of the United States of America. And so, with all of this terrible stuff that's going on right now, we have got to build our own wall, okay? <laughs> but our wall is going to be in the U.S. Congress. And our wall is going to be there of Congress, with progressive Congress people that are going to stop all of this nonsense that is coming out of the White House, okay? And we can do it, because we have elections coming in 2018. You know, I mean, this is it, 2018, we're here already, okay? <laughs> okay. And I guess you have your primaries really early here, uh, here in, in Texas. So I just want to urge all of you to please, please get out there, and not only vote. I'm sure if I ask, oh, let me ask, I'll ask the question, okay? How many of you voted in the last election? Let me see your hands. They could vote, okay? That's awesome. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question. How many of you went out and knocked on doors or did phone banking to get other people out to vote? No. <laughs> Dismal. <laughs> so we really have to uh, take our responsibilities as citizens seriously. And I'm just gonna say to all of you, please volunteer. Volunteer that you're going to go out there not only uh, to encourage people to register to vote, but you're going to go out there and the people that are registered, you know, get them to vote. Explain to them how important it is. I don't know if you know what happened in the state of Virginia just recently. There was an election and there were 17 new delegates elected. There were Republicans and Social Democrats. Uh, the Republicans ran a really uh, anti-immigrant campaign, uh, anti-gay, anti-transgender campaign, anti-women campaign, and guess what happened? 17 Republicans lost their seat, okay? But the 17th person only won by one vote. And then it turned out they did a recount, and it turned out that one of the votes was really a Republican vote, so that person wasn't able to take their seat, the Republican won by one vote. Not only that, but the control of the state legislature with that 17th delegate went to the Republicans by one vote. One person who voted or didn't vote made the difference. So we really have to make people understand how important voting is. Now, marches are great, okay? protests are great, but if we don't take that march to the ballot box, nothing changes. Everything stays the same or gets worse, as we've seen. You know? So we really have to go out there and just urge everybody, please get engaged. Please get engaged. Please go out there and put on your tennis shoes, you know, and it's good for you to do all that walking, <laughs> good physical exercise, you know, and if you can't walk, you can uh, get on the telephone and call people and urge them to vote uh, because there is no time like now that we've got to do it. And, and I want to say, uh, uh, again, I'm going to quote Coretta Scott King, uh, especially for the women out there. You know, Coretta Scott King said, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to change that phrase 
up a little bit, and I'm going to use the F word. Feminist. <laughs> Feminist, a person that stands up for immigrants' rights, for workers' rights, for women's reproductive rights. Yes, the right to abortion, and we have to normalize that. By the way, we have to normalize that. You know, who stands up for LGBT rights? You know, who, stands, who cares about our planet and worries about global warming? You know, these are so. These are the I call the criteria for what a feminist is. And so the men in the room can also be feminists, okay? So, so we want to say, when we say, I want to say the word feminists take power, not just women take power. Because there are some women like Sarah Palin, we prefer that they not take power. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, kind of this is our moment, you know, and I want to, uh, uh, you know, there was a Spanish philosopher, his name was Jose Ortega y de Sed, he was part of the Spanish Republic. And uh, during, just before Franco took power, the dictator, in Spain. And he wrote a book called The Revolution of the Masses. And in that book, it's a little teeny book, it's only about 100 pages, but he said the thesis of his book was that in a country, if you do not have an educated citizenry, then the powerful and the greedy will rule. The powerful and the greedy will rule. And I think that's where we're at in our country right now. The powerful and the greedy will rule. So I think when we think about that we do have a democracy and that we can actually have a voice in changing that. And I know a lot of people in our country, they don't think that they can make any difference. And that's why they don't vote. And I know when we were organizing farm workers and people would say to us, how, how are you going to organize the farm workers? They're not citizens, they don't have any money. You know, they don't have any assets, and they're very poor, you know? How are you gonna organize them? And you know what we said to the farm workers? You have the power. And the power is in your person. And this is all the power that you need. But you can't do it by yourself. You can only do it when all of us come together. Then you take direct action, direct nonviolent action, and that is how we can make the changes. And the farm workers did it. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, Dolores, can I see your hand? Can I see your hands? Good. Well, for the rest of you, if you haven't seen that, please see that movie. It's going to be uh, coming out <clears throat> at the end of March. It's on public uh, broadcast, PBS, and it'll be free for the public to see it, uh, independent lens. But the one thing about that movie, and, and when you know about the farm worker movement, is you see that farm workers the poorest of the poor, the most dedicated people, were able to defeat President Nixon and Ronald Reagan, the governor of California, to be able to get basic human rights like toilets in the fields and cold drinking water, you know, the right to organize in California. And by the way, the, the cold drinking water and the toilets in the field, that's also here for the state of Texas and throughout the whole United States of America. And it was just the workers themselves that were able to do that by marching, by, and then by boycotting, by getting 17 million Americans not to eat grapes, by people power. That's the way they made it happen. And so when we think of what the farm workers did to get people in, in many cases had no formal education, many people were illiterate because they never had the opportunity to go to school, and yet they were able to make this happen. So when we think about the rest of us that are speak English or are bilingual, you know, and uh, we have an education, and we have some kind of modest means that there may be, but that we can make the changes. And so that's what I think we really have to really understand in today's world. And that, again, we are the only ones that can make it happen. We have to think about that. And then we've got to stop these attacks on people in our society. And I know uh, probably a lot of us have relatives, um, uh, not only in Texas, but maybe in the Midwest or other places, that, that are uh, anti-feminist. That they don't understand a woman's right to choose. That they don't understand that a gay person should have the right to marry or fall in love with or live with whomever they want. And uh, one of our Mexican presidents, uh, uh, the indigenous, uh, Benito Juarez, who was from Oaxaca, an indigenous president uh, of, Mexico, of Mexico, when we got the, uh, we got the liberation from Spain. And he had a very uh, important saying, and I want to share it with you. I'll say it in Spanish first, and I think almost every Latino family knows this. And the saying is, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. Translated, that means respecting other people's rights is peace. 
the right for a woman to decide whether or not she wants to have children or for a medical purpose needs an abortion, that is her human right. For a person to decide or they want to marry someone of their own sex or live with someone, that is their human right. Because actually, what a woman does with her body is nobody's business but her own. Right? <laughs> A gay person, lesbian, transgender, bisexual person, that is again their human right. Because what somebody does with, with their life doesn't affect us. So why should we try to you know, interfere with their lives? And we've got to make people understand that. And, uh, and I know uh, because of what we, many of us who were raised in the Catholic Church or evangelical churches, whatever, uh, where uh, we have been kind of taught that all these things are a sin, etc. And I, I know it's kind of hard to make that, that transition to say these are people's human rights and it doesn't affect me. And, and we, you know, we have to, I'm a person of faith, you know, and by the way, I have 11 children, you know. My daughter Juanita prefers dogs, okay? <laughs> So, but I shouldn't, uh, you know, have, I shouldn't impose my beliefs on somebody else, you know. And I, I think faith is good, and we need religion, many of us, we need faith, but there's a difference, I think, between faith and religion. And we shouldn't have a religious people dictate to us how we are, we are going to live or how we're going to vote, right? Especially how we're going to vote. So uh, these are the things I think that we have to consider about what's going on in our world right now and uh, the things that we have to work on. And uh, we, the other thing is, please, some of you run for office. I'm serious about this because when we talk about the things, I, when I start talking about education and the things that we need to include in our school books, we've got to take over the school boards. Our organization, the Dolores Weather Foundation, uh, for the last few years we've been working on stopping the school to prison pipeline. And uh, we ha actually had to sue our high school district because of the huge suspensions of Latino and African American students. They were suspending African American children almost 600 times higher than white kids. And Latinos 500 times higher than white kids, okay? And uh, now, uh, so we sued our high school district, and guess what, they settled a lawsuit. Now they have to have positive behavior intervention system, restorative justice. They've got to have the teachers learn cultural competency. Yeah. 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 Uh, African American History Month for a whole month and Hispanic Heritage Month for a whole month. They've got to recruit teachers uh, from Latino areas instead of from Iowa and South Dakota. <laughs> We've got to change the whole set. And in addition, uh, they have to have community forums where the parents and the students and the uh, community can speak out about the things that need to be changed. And we're working in about seven or eight different school districts right now. And the way that we work is we organize the parents. And then they are the ones that go to the school uh, districts and, and challenge them on some of their practices. And then we encourage some people to get on the school board. So we have farm worker women on school boards. And we have more worker women and men on utility boards, right? On the water boards. And I did the one, one of our ladies, uh, Leticia Prado, uh, when she got elected to the school board, uh, the principal had decided to stop the uh, breakfast program for the farm worker children. So she got rid of the principal and kept the program. <laughs> so, you know, this is uh, uh, taking the power, right? But you know, this whole thing about the suspension of Latinos and African-American students, it's all over the country, not just in California. I know it's here in Texas, it's in Chicago, it's in New York. And recently, we found another school district that was horrendous. And in that school district, and we're just starting our first organizing, and you know, we don't go in and try to sell the issue. We organize the parents, because they're the ones that have to have the power. And, and you know, to create that kind of leadership, this is the way that we organize. But in this new school district that we just started organizing a couple of months ago, the suspension and expulsion rate of African American students is 81%. 81%. And they never call the parents when they think the kids do something wrong, they call the police. And so right away the kids get a record almost instantly. 
and, and this is happening everywhere. And we know we have more people in prison in the United States of America than they do in India or China. And those populations are billions of people. And we are only millions. And so this is a whole prison industry that we have to stop. And it's a private prison industry, you know, to make money off of the bodies of the people here. And even when we think about the immigration issue, when people cross the border, they don't hurt anybody. It's not a criminal act. It's a civil violation. And they have only recently made it a criminal act so they can put people in prison. And right after they started this anti-immigrant uh, uh, philosophy of the Republican Party, they built new prisons. They built one especially for people from El Salvador. And they were right here in Texas, right here in Texas. And where I come from, in California, in the Central Valley of California, since 1965, they've only built one university, the University of Reset, and they have built 22 prisons. So we can see, and we know, that to keep somebody in prison costs about $60,000 a year. To educate somebody in a college only costs about $40,000. So, you know, where's the math in that? And this is taxpayer dollars. Taxpayer dollars. So, you know, we have, I know we have a lot of things on the agenda that need to be fixed. But I think if we can start, like, with ourselves and just starting to pay attention to what's going on, and especially the people that we elect to office, uh, to make sure that we elect people to office that are going to fight for us and that are going to make sure that our tax dollars are used where they should be used and not to uh, hold up uh, this prison system that we are all paying for. And that somehow our tax dollars are going to the wealthy instead of you know going to the uh, kind of services that we need. In California, again, uh, I, I'm sorry to be making the comparison, but, <laughs> but we passed a law uh, uh, actually uh, eight years ago and we renewed it in the last election that our millionaires in California have to pay 3% more in state taxes. If you're, a, if you're a millionaire, you have to pay 2% more. You pay a half a million a year, you pay 2% more. You make $250,000, you pay 1% more. As a result, we bought in over $9 billion every year in the state of California. And that money is going for education and for health services. So the only thing I can say is that, you know what? If we can do it in California, you can do it in Texas, right? Yeah, you can do it in Texas. And I do believe uh, that we are going to have a new political revolution. We saw it happen in Alabama, right? When you got a senator, Democratic senator, uh, in, in a very, very southern state. Uh, we saw it in the West Virginia, I mean, excuse me, in Virginia, the state of Virginia, where you got a Democratic governor, uh, Ralph Northam, just recently elected. And uh, you've got all of these 16 delegates now that they kind of almost uh, clipped the, the state legislature. And uh, but we can do this all over the country. But the thing is that uh, we're not going to be able to do it unless everybody uh, really uh, gets involved. One of the things I do want to say about racism, and, and we think about what a lot of people say, oh my God, what's going on right now? Uh, and I think the one thing about what's happening right now is that when racism is so visible, and it's so ugly, and it's so hurtful, and we know that it's, it's like a cancer in our country, and it's affecting our, our whole country, and now our whole world, then we know it's, we've got to do something about it. You know, I say it's like a sword that you have, you know, on your hand, and you don't pay attention till it gets really red and ugly and orange. <laughs> then you say, okay, we've got to do something about this, okay? <laughs> really, this is really getting dangerous, right? And so, it's, it's, uh, so I think when we feel that, that, that pain that we have happening in our country, then that, I think that that is kind of a good thing. And I do believe, in my heart, that when we get over this period that we're in, we're going to come out stronger, just like we did in the 60s. And in the 60s, a lot of the, or, or a lot of the groups that were just barely organizing, like the women's movement, the second wave of the women's movement, uh, LGBT movement was just, just starting, the environmental movement was just starting, the civil rights movement, you know, all of these movements were just starting then in the 60s, and that's when, you know, people were again getting killed, all these things were happening, and, and then what happened? You know, we came out stronger. And I think the same thing is going to happen again because so many more people are now getting involved and getting active, and I think we're going to come out stronger. But uh, the thing is that, that you know we can't give up, and we realize that all of us have got to put uh, our effort also 
you know, volunteer for some of these organizations and need help, you know, whether it's a labor union or an environmental group, uh, immigrants' rights organizations. And hey, how about the Dreamers, okay? Let's give a big old hand for the Dreamers. <laughs> Courageous, you know, that they were out there willing to come out and fight for their rights, you know. And of course, President Obama listened to them and he was able to give that directive uh, so that they could stay in this country, you know. And we hope that it will happen again. And they say there might be a government shutdown. The government's going to shut down for the dreamers. How about that? Okay. <laughs> and just one other thing, too. Um, when we think about who we are as, as, as a, a human race, that we are one human race. You know, we have a lot of ethnic groups, we have a lot, a lot of cultures, we have a lot of nationalities, but we only have one human race. And what's the scientific name of our human race? Somebody throw it out there. Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, right? And where did our human race begin? Africa. Our human race began in Africa. And our human race then, you know, traveled across the planet, you know, through the Bering Strait, down through the Americas. One of our tribes got lost and was up there in Europe and it got really, really cold and they lost their color, right? <laughs> now, you have to go to the tanning salon or to the beach to get your color back. <laughs> Think about, and I mean, this is science. This is science, you know. <laughs> you know, that we are all Africans of different shades of colors. We are one human family. And as one human family, then we need to support each other, you know, and remind everybody. You know, remind everybody. You know, I had my own DNA done by a television station. I want to know how Latino are you? <laughs> I figured I was like 60-40 because my mother's family uh, were from Spain and France and then I found out also back to the United Kingdom and on my dad's side they're from Mexico and uh, it was really interesting on my dad's side they came all the way from Peru to Central America to Mexico on my mother's side they came from the United Kingdom uh, to France and to Spain and France and, and uh, you know uh, to the United States of America but then I said, where's my Africanist? And he said, it's here. It was 0 0.003, my Africanist. But then the guy said, you know what? You're also 0 0.005 Neanderthal. <laughs> and of course, I come from the European side, right? Neanderthals, <laughs> <laughs> you know? All the Europeans are the Neanderthals. So, Anyway, uh, so I think that we say we are all one people, right? And we can say uh, to David Duke and the KKK and the White Citizens Council, the alt-right and the neo-Nazis, get over it, you Africans, okay? Just get over it. <laughs> you know, and they got to understand that we're all one people, okay? And so I know that all of us here, that we're going to be part of this great movement and we're going to keep resisting, and we're going to keep working, and we're going to really, uh, like Dr. Martin Luther King said, well, we will see that dream, but it's not going to happen without us, okay? okay. It's not going to happen without us. So I want to ask you to do a, 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 a little chat right now uh, on the same issue. Uh, there's a, a Zulu word uh, from Africa, and it means we, the people, are coming together. We, the people, are coming together to fight for justice. And the word is Wozani. Wozani. So I want all of us to say that word together. So I'm going to say one, two, three, and let's say that word Wozani, okay? Let's go. One, two, three. Wozani. All right. And I think that is a commitment that all of us are going to be working together. And then I want to ask you to say something else. And uh, I want, oh, before I do that, you know, when we get, uh, when we get uh, kind of maybe disappointed, I was uh, depressed about what's going on right now. Uh, there was a Chile, Chilean poet named Pablo Neruda. And he said, you can cut all the flowers, but you can't hold back the spring. You can cut all the flowers, but you can't hold back the spring. 
So we have to think of ourselves as being uh, those gardeners that are going to go out there and we're going to sow those seeds of justice and righteousness, right? We're going to sow those seeds and, and they are going to spring. And, you know, in, in, in the, in the spring will come back and we're going to come back with gusto, right? We're going to come back with gusto and like roses with a little bit of spines. <laughs> a little bit of spines, okay? So uh, to make that commitment that we will save our country, we'll save our democracy, and we'll uh, commit, you know, uh, keep on fighting for justice. So I think we have uh, uh, time to have some questions, but before that, uh, I will ask you another question ahead of time. And the question uh, I'm going to ask all of you is who's got the power? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the question, but I want you to shout it out really loud. I want to say, who's got the power? And I want you to say, do. we've got the power. <laughs> but we have to do it together, okay? <laughs> it's not about Wonder Woman, it's about Wonder People. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the question, who's got the power? I want to say, we've got the power. And when I say what kind of power, I want to say people power, all right? Okay, let's go. Who's got the power? We got the power. What kind of power? People power. All right, are we going to go out there and organize, especially get people out to vote? What, what do we say? ¿Se puede o no se puede? Sí, se puede. Right, and that's yes we can for those of you that are about to go to challenge. <laughs> We are a little technological challenge um, with our mics, uh, as well as if you have a question and you are in the overflow room, we do have someone in there with a the mic, so we will try and see if we can get that to work. Uh, so if you have a question I would like that you ask, that you please kindly line up as nice and pretty right here. And if y'all have a question, y'all yeah. together facing the same issues, but something that I witnessed growing up and even today in everyday life, especially here in Texas, people don't always talk about it, but there is a lot of conflict between our two communities. I don't know why, but it's there. And so I'm wondering what are some things that we can do to bridge that gap and to help those who aren't in this community and those who aren't in this room realize that we're really all on the same side. Well, I think that uh, society uh, has a good way of dividing people, and they've been at it, they're, they're kind of experts at it, as we know, and uh, a lot of the, uh, this is my take on this, because uh, I was very fortunate to grow up in a very racially diverse uh, town, Stockton, California, uh, my comadre, um, Charles Satterfield is uh, African American. I personally have uh, about, I think, six or seven of my grandchildren are Afro-Mexican. So I've been very blessed that way. And I think that there's a lot of, again, ignorance, because I think a lot of the uh, people, especially the recent people that come from Mexico, uh, they don't know the history of the civil rights struggle. They know about Martin Luther King, 
but they don't know about Emmett Till, you know? And uh, so, and then I think that uh, there's always been, and I'm sure some of us here have heard this in the room, but you know, uh, African -American, uh, American people, black people, they don't want to do the work, right? You know, like farm work, for instance. You know, African Americans, I mean, you know, pick cotton, pick all of the crops, you know, even in California. But uh, there's this racism that they, and they do that because they want to import, they want to bring people from, from Mexico and other countries to come in here at very cheap wages, you know? and to exploit them. And so they have kind of created this cultural divide, uh, this racism between uh, the two groups. Uh, and I think that as leaders, and, and just as, as yourself, anybody, that we're gonna say we're not gonna put up with this, and we're gonna reach out, we're gonna work together with each other. So the way that we uh, get rid of that, and the, the division is by working together, and to show them that we can work together. And uh, we've got to uh, educate the Latino community about the struggle of African Americans in the United States of America. I, I hope all of you have seen the documentary 13, yes. and, and, or the James Baldwin story also. You know? uh, and, and then I, would, I think we also have to uh, uh, teach uh, the African American community uh, what the struggles that immigrants go through in our country also. We're all you know, uh, under the same, uh, you might say, this, the same uh, umbrella of racism that we, that we, in different degrees. And I think we, we can't, uh, and none of us can say that the Latinos have it as bad as African Americans have had it in this country, you know, uh, because I do believe that uh, African American in this country are under a continuing, and I'm going to say a continuing genocide. When you think of the numbers of African Americans, people who are in prison, in prisons, for instance, you know, and the thing that we're seeing in the work that we're doing, it's almost uh, some kind of social engineering that's been happening in our country. And, and <clears throat> like uh, the number of people, uh, black folks that have been in, in prison unjustly, and many of whom have been released, right? There's a story given in the New York Times about all the people in Louisiana that spent like 20 or 30 or 40 years in prison for crimes that they never committed. So it's something we have to work at it. And, uh, uh, and again, educators can help us do this, okay? Thank you. So we are going to try and take a question from the overflow room. Can you hear us? Oh, yes, we can. Hi, um, I, I wanted to ask a question about, sorry, this delay is, Making me feel weird. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask how you invite people from the working class to participate in uh, activist movements and reconsidering their identity. Um, I, to my knowledge, I know that working class people are very busy. They don't have the time to sit around and talk about the philosophy of identity and ethics. <laughs> Um, and I do know that there is quite a heavy representation of privileged university students and scholars in the activist movements. And I wanted to ask you how to uh, turn the microphone towards the working class. Well, I think the working class may not talk about it, but they live it every day. You know, uh, they are living. Uh, kind of the philosophies of our country and the ethics of our country. Uh, but, and uh, the way that we organize, as I mentioned earlier, is that we meet the people in their homes and uh, approach them, again, approaching people that are uh, organ labor organizations, and we do have those in Texas, not as strong, of course, as in California, uh, but uh, approaching them also. But, and, I mean, working people are everywhere. <laughs> They're in the stores where you shop, you know, your grocery stores, your drug stores, and, uh, you see them on construction sites, etc. And I think uh, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if they have like a labor studies uh, class here, or you have in many, uh, even here in Texas, you have uh, sort of uh, uh, communities or, or you have uh, centers, uh, workers' centers, and that might be one way to do it. And contacting some of the local labor unions here, and they would you know, put you in touch with some of the workers, and maybe some of the workers that are organizing uh, to form a union at, the, at their uh, working place. So that's uh, fairly easy. You just have to reach out to, to working people because they're everywhere. You can find them really easy. <laughs> uh, hello, my question 
concerns the students and the young people that are, they know that there's something desperately wrong, but they are drawn in so many directions on, on what to try to fix, what to try to fix first. Uh, do you have any advice on how to center yourself as a young person going into activism and which area would maybe be best for you to start with, to get your feet wet? Well, I think voting. <laughs> yeah, getting involved in a, in a political campaign, uh, because when you get involved in a political campaign, you really learn at the grassroots of, of, uh, of organizing. I call knocking on doors organizing 101. You know, because when you're out there knocking on doors and talking to people and hearing what their issues are, and then trying to convince them about the importance, why they should be engaged, why they should uh, get out there and vote, and getting them also to volunteer. Because we need to build a huge volunteer base. We're never going to have enough money to, for people to do this as paid staff. So if people can volunteer, I was a volunteer myself for about six years with the community service organization. Uh, during that time, we passed a whole bunch of laws in, uh, in, in Sacramento in some of the national level uh, before I ever had a staff position. So I think volunteering is the best way to learn things. And, uh, you know, you can uh, but definitely uh, get involved in voting. I mean, we have enough people right here in this room uh, that they could turn a congressional district in a minute, you know? You know, just by going out there and, and knocking on doors and then decide, you know, what particular organization we want to volunteer for and focus on. And you can probably also do more than, more than one. And I know for students, it's hard uh, because they give you so much homework, right? Uh, <laughs> makes your mind kind of, oh, you know? Uh, but if you can just do a few hours, uh, one of my daughters, she volunteers for this uh, uh, burrito project where they make burritos for the homeless, and she does that every Sunday, every Sunday morning to find the homeless people to feed them. So, you know, you, you can find one organization that really attracts you. Okay, we have one more question from the overflow room. I have a question. Uh, I have a question relating to how you would characterize the uh, promotion of racism in this country by our leaders at the top level. Would you think thinks it's correct? <laughs> would you think it's correct to correct to characterize uh, that tendency? as uh, ethnic cleansing? Um, yeah, I think it gives license to people that are racist uh, to carry out uh, very violent acts uh, against people. Even myself, uh, I have uh, faced a lot more racism, I think, in the last year uh, than I had in many years prior to this. I think many of us in the room uh, probably have also felt the same thing. And uh, also the disregard for women you know, uh, you know, the women uh, can just be seen as uh, objects of sex and, and can be assaulted by, by men, uh, the way that we have seen uh, the president kind of make light of that whole issue. Uh, I think it's a very dangerous uh, the time that we're in when it, comes, when it comes to the president's actions. So I, I would say yes. And again, I think that's why when we think of this racism, issue that then that means that each and every one of us, especially our institutions, our democratic institutions, our schools, our corporations, you know, that we've also uh, got to realize, uh, and we see like right now with the Me Too movement, where people are acting very quickly in terms of women's rights. Well, we need to see that same kind of energy uh, put into uh, doing something about racism. And, and looking at our, our areas there, and how many people of color do we have? Uh, in, in, in our establishment where people are working, you know, uh, especially uh, uh, people, African Americans, you know, and so it's, we've got to have some kind of measures uh, so that it, it'd be nice if we could out all the racists, right? <laughs> like the way we've been outing all the sexual harassers. Well, some of them are outing themselves, right, because they, they, they're getting that torch and they're carrying it. Um, hi, um, just to start out, I'm a bilingual education manager at the University of Texas, so 
this question is very personal to me and to my future students. So the education system has stripped us from our culture. Spanish has, uh, bilingual education has even become a word of taboo to many people. So what is your advice to me, to my cohort at school, to my future students that are reclaiming their Spanish, reclaiming their language? What is your advice to them? Well, I think it's important that we do that. I'm very blessed that I was born in the state of New Mexico, which is a bilingual <laughs> state. And I learned Spanish and English from a very young age, and uh, to this day I am bilingual. And you know, uh, the United States of America is the only country where people only speak one language. You know, I mean, it, it, so it's crazy and it's xenophobic to think that there's something wrong with speaking another language. And that, yes, so we should definitely encourage it. And we should encourage other languages also. We should all be learning Chinese, for instance, you know? <laughs> really. So, uh, yeah, well, thank you for doing that. For being about and, you know, we have to try to get to make that a policy in all the school system so that, because uh, children learn languages very easily, because different parts of our brain uh, learn languages, and uh, children can learn languages very easily, and we should encourage all children uh, to learn another language. Thank you. similar to one that was already asked, but aside from voting and aside from helping out campaigns, what are some other ways that young individuals or just any individual can get involved um, and kind of shift the ways of thinking and the political system as it is? Well, I think supporting legislation, for instance, whatever everybody here in this room, and yet I would love to ask all of you here to send an email, make a phone call to your U.S. Senator to vote for the DREAM Act, okay? Please put it Tomorrow, all of the, US, the your two U.S. senators would get that message from all of this group right here. They will definitely pay attention. You know, I was with Michael Moore, by the way, he had a Broadway show, and, and he said there's three things you have to do every day when you wake up. Wash your face, brush your teeth, and call your congressman. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, doing, taking actions on legislation, and not only in Congress, but at the state level, state level here, and you know, showing up even at city council meetings, school board meetings, but definitely right now at what's happening on the state level and at the congressional level. That's really important. Thank you. Um, so my question has to do with our young women activists, particularly Latina activists, and any advice that you have for them as to dealing with the machismo in our culture, in the movement, um, how you uh, handled it, how you still deal with it, um, any advice that you have on that? Well, um, I would call them on it, on the machismo, <laughs> and uh, you know, also uh, make sure you have allies. And I would say this to all the women in the room too, you know, wherever you're at in your job or, or you're trying to get allies, because we know this uh, machismo is, is very pervasive in our society, and also let them know that you belong to the National Organization for Women, you belong to the Feminist Majority, uh, you belong to the Me Too organization, so that uh, everybody at your work site knows that you're not alone, okay? And the other thing too, when we talk about education, we have to change the way that we educate our women because our women are taught to be victims. And when we think of the animal kingdom, who's the most powerful? Male or female, right? The, the female, because they have to watch the babies. But somehow in our society here, we teach women to be weak. And our, our culture, like Disney, you know, saying that uh, Prince Charming's gonna come, uh, and he's gonna give you a kiss, it's gonna wake you up, and you're gonna live happily ever after. And we know just the opposite happens. You know? The, the, the pretender comes, give you a kiss, and there goes your career, goes your school, and then baby's daddy's gone, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have to change that, because we, we have to really uh, educate our young women that they are going to have to support themselves. They are going to have to protect themselves. They are going to have to have the courage to speak up for themselves. And they have to set up their own support system. And we've got to change that. Uh, if we're going to really change our world, women have got to step up. And I want to say also to the women, when well, you have opportunities, and uh, sometimes we hold back because we think, oh, I'm not prepared, you know, I'm not really qualified. Do it like the guys do it, learn on the job, pretend it's your job.
thank you so much for everything that you have done. I'm going to cry. Um, and the sacrifices that you have made. Um, you are such a huge inspiration to me. I am an art educator and an artist and an activist. And I'm here with um, one of my students. Um, and I wish I carried with me the souls and the light of the hundreds of Latino and Latinx students. It has been heartbreaking to me that Texas has chosen to leave you out of our textbooks, which go um, all across the state. So I did what I could in my art class to teach about you. And um, I guess on that note, um, what are some of your favorite community um, creative art projects that you have um, done or seen over the years? Well, I just came back from uh, in Los Angeles. They have a, a, a big art project. It's called uh, uh, In Action. Yeah, In Action. And it is really wonderful. It's all of these uh, young artists uh, that have made these uh, uh, paintings about the resistance movement. And it is absolutely fabulous. And it's going to be touring, so I'm sure at some point it'll be coming to Texas. Uh, but I just uh, well, watch out for it. It's called In Action or Into Action. And uh, they have a lot of art pieces. And you know, when we think about art and culture, that's something also that we have to think that we've got to bring back into our schools. You know, I learned how to play the violin in grammar school. This is right after the, the, the Depression or the WPA. I, do, I took dancing lessons. In, in my grammar school, my elementary school, uh, because we had three teachers, and uh, that was all part of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, uh, actions that he took during the Depression to put artists to work. And when we think about what's happening in, in the future, when more jobs are disappearing, and uh, we don't want to have them just put everybody in jail because there's no jobs for them, right? So we have to think about, okay, uh, bringing the arts back because everybody has some kind of a, uh, a, you know, some kind of a gift for art, whether it be theater, uh, painting, uh, it could be music, it could be dance. Uh, we don't know what our gift is, a lot of us might know, uh, but we have to have uh, something for people to do if there's not going to be any work. And there's got to be money to pay for them to do it. So uh, we've got to, in, on our long agenda that we have, we've got to say we've got to bring art, Back into our schools, we got to bring uh, you know theater and, and dance and uh, and painting and all of that ceramics back into our school systems. And we know also uh, when people are able to express uh, their emotions through art, it really helps them a lot. And and it's again, an art is very important because uh, when you see an art piece, it's not just looking at that art piece. There's a lot of emotion uh, to that art piece. And so when we see a great painting, we remember that painting. Uh, we hear a great song, we remember that song. When we see a theater piece, we remember that. And uh, uh, it's so, so we, we really have to fight, I think, to, to have art for, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. all of our Southwestern community, faculty, staff, students, as well as thank you to everyone so very much for coming and driving out here from Houston, San Antonio, even from Austin. I hear I-35 was very bad. Um, but thank you guys so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed this evening. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, this was the first part of, the, um, of our MLK celebrations that are going on. Uh, we will have the Race and Ethnicity Symposium January 23rd and uh, January 25th here at Southwestern, and those will be, both be at 5.30. I would also like to invite everyone to a ceremony naming the forgotten, a ceremony of remembrance, which will be taking place in the Lois Perkins Chapel on February 27th. And I would like to announce uh, our website for the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Uh, so you can see the work that we're doing is doloreshuerta.org. Uh, DoloresWinter.org, and you can go on our website. And if anybody wants to join our social justice movement, uh, we'll be outside. We can have some cards and we can sign up and people want to. Uh, I don't know if we have time to take pictures or not, uh, but you can sign up. And we have some brochures that we will be passing out also that has the work about our foundation. Because we also do work on health issues also. Uh, we have an LGBT component, and of course, a lot of work on civic education and uh, uh, the education work that I spoke about earlier. So if you want to learn about our foundation, you have the information there. So thank you very much. Uh, it was a great evening. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs>